Okay, I guess we've started again. Um, the analysis, that's uh, not mine. Okay. Uh, the analysis of meteor showers began early in the 20th century with Ernst Uppik, who was a, an Estonian student at the Moscow University at the time. And uh, he was still in college when he did this. Uh, when I did the follow-up to his work, I was already in graduate school, so I have to look up to him for doing this while he was in college. When I was in college, I made a star map, so that was <laughs> a somewhat lesser accomplishment. He proposed the double count method. Well, there's Ernst himself in earlier years and later years. He lived a very long time, if you see that, he lived to 90 91, actually, he died a little before his birthday. Okay. He called this the double count method because it involved two people watching the same meteor shower in the same direction at the same time, with the idea being that uh, two sets of eyes are better than one. Because uh, any observer is going to miss some meteors unless they're just extraordinarily bright. They're, when they get down near the limit of visibility, they're just going to miss some. Uh, any observer will see n meteors, and that's a fraction of the true total n, so n over p, uh, in the next line there, is the fraction of meteors that you'll actually see, the number you, the number you see out of the total. Okay? Observer 1 will see n1 meteors, that's how the subscripts work in this, so the probability 1 is n1 over n, and observer 2 will see that number of meteors, and that's going to be his probability factor or uh, perception coefficient as the number he sees out of the total that was there. Keep in mind that nobody's going to see all of them, so, but there is a number that there is all of them, and that's the capital N, but each person only sees a fraction of those. Okay? So the number that the first person sees is going to be his probability factor times the total. All it is is rearrange the equation a little bit. N2 is P2 over N. The neat thing about this equation is once you determine what this factor is for a person, it seems to apply throughout the evening and from one night to the next and maybe even from one year to the next. Like if somebody typically sees 85% of the meteors, then that's going to be part of his uh, qualifications for observing meteor showers. So then here's the neat part. M is the number counted by both observers because you'll see some of them in common. They say, I see this one, I see it too. I'm sure I see this one, but I don't. I see this one, but you don't. So M is the one counted, the number counted by both observers. Now, probabilities are always multiplied. And we'll elaborate on that a little bit. The total number of the, that people will see together is going to be both fractions multiplied by each other times the total. Now each one of these fractions is less than one, isn't it? So when you multiply those two together, this number's got to be smaller than uh, the number either one of them saw, right? Because it's when you depend on two people to do things at the same time, one of them's usually going to screw up. So the likelihood of seeing everything together is going to be less however many uh, observers you've got their probability factor in on. Coin toss. If you flip a coin, there's a 50% chance that it'll land heads or tails. What is it if you flip two coins? What's the chances of it being uh, both of them heads? It'd be one half times one half, wouldn't it? Multiply the probabilities together, that'll be one out of four times. If you have three coins, how many, uh, what's the probability? It'd be one-eighth, wouldn't it? If all of them line up the same way, a half times a half times a half. <coughs> Band concert, what has that got to do with anything? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wonder about that, huh? Okay, what are the chances that a clarinet player can get through a whole piece without the reed squeaking? Okay, suppose it's 80%. Uh, you can, he's playing a solo for five minutes, there's an 80% chance that he gets through it without that unnerving screech noise that happens. Okay, suppose there are 20 clarinet players. Is that still an 80% chance? 
is 80% times 80% times 80% 20 times. So 0.8 to the 20th power. That works out to 1%. So you'd have to listen to 100 band concerts before you had a hope of getting through one without a squeak. So, uh, and then there are other problems that would arise. So that's how this works. The probabilities are always multiplied. The more you have working on it, the lower the result is going to be. This is the first argument I've ever heard for fewer clarinet players. <laughs> yeah. That's, if there's 100%, 100% to the 20th power, it'd still be 100%. Okay. If you put those two relationships together, you'll find that the number that you see uh, the, the, excuse me, the number that is actually there is the number each one sees divided by the number they both see together. Isn't that pretty simple? That's what he came up with uh, when he was in college, that you have two people counting meteors, you keep track of how many each one sees individually and how many they saw together, and the relationship is just multiply the two that they saw together divided by the total uh, that they saw together. And that gives us the number that nobody saw, but they were there. So that's uh, a very straightforward probability relationship. Okay? Then you can go back and solve for the uh, probabilities that each one is, you know, their reliability coefficients. You just take the N1 divided by N and N2 divided by N. That gives you the reliability fraction for each one of the observers right there. Okay? Okay, here's an example. Suppose observer one sees 15 meters, observer two sees 18, and together they see 10 in common. So then the n, the number that were actually there, would be 15 times 18 divided by 10, or 27. You can see none of them saw anywhere near all of them, but we can reliably estimate that there were 27 meteors there. Then going back and taking 15 out of 27, and 18 out of 27, we can get the uh, perception coefficient or reliability or probability for each one of the two observers, 0 0.56, 0 0.67. And again, I'll remind you that the number we're looking for, the true number of meteors, is always greater than what any one person sees. Okay, okay. now this perception coefficient is supposedly due to two factors. There's probably more than that, but when anybody says there are two things, it's always more than that, but two main things anyhow, the chi and pi, the pi in the sky, if you will. Okay, next. The chi factor depends only on the brightness of the meteor and is the same for all observers. And uh, if it's second magnitude or brighter, there's 100% chance you're going to see it unless you're rooting around in a bag of potato chips or texting or something, then you might miss it. But for second magnitude or brighter, the chance is 100% that you're going to see it. Fifth magnitude, it's only a 1 in 10 chance that you'll see it. So that uh, takes the chances way down when it gets dimmer. So that personal coefficient, pi, is the other part of this. And that varies with each observer. It might just depend on their eyesight, if whether it's good or not, or if they have good peripheral vision. But it also depends on the location of the meteor in the field of view. Uh, if it's right in the center, uh, it's, yeah, that's it, yeah. Uh, 80 to 90 percent near the center of the field of view, but only 20 to 50 percent out in the peripheral area. And some people just can't concentrate long enough to look at the sky and see if a meteor is actually happening or not. You, you'll run into some of those as well. Okay, Epic wanted to determine the actual number of Perseids per unit volume of space. In other words, those little clouds of meteoric particles that the Earth plows through during a meteor shower. He wanted to find the density of particles per cubic mile or whatever in the Perseid meteor swarm. That's a pretty good undertaking for a college student, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, first, he has to determine the zenithal hourly rate. Now, I've referred to that earlier as being an impossibly optimistic count, but uh, it's the only way to put all of the observations on a common footing. You take all of the factors into account 
that keep you from seeing as many meteors as you could and then correct for those and then that puts everything on an equal footing. So that's the zenithal hourly rate. You get all the counts to compare them from different conditions, different times. Here it is, the definition. An estimate of the number of shower meteors that would be seen by a single observer watching an unobstructed area of the sky, no clouds, no trees, no barns, for a period of one hour with the showers radiant at the zenith, straight up, and a limiting magnitude of 6.5. Now, what's your reaction to that? Mine is, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> so that's why that ZHR number you see in the tables is always so much higher than anything you're likely to see. Okay. Here's how to get the zenithal hourly rate from the numbers you've counted by that double count method. It's only uh, four factors involved. I'm sure, again, there are probably more than that, but we're going to consider four. Okay. F is the reciprocal of the fraction of the sky not obscured by clouds or other obstructions. The next one. Suppose the sky is 20% obscured. That means it's 80% not obscured. And 1 over the 80% is 1.25. So all else being equal, if you had a 20% obscuring of the sky and you counted 100 meteors, then you need to fix that up to 125 to make it comparable to the zenithal hourly rate. You have to fudge factor in the uh, fact that you couldn't see the whole sky. Okay, the next one is the biggie, the correction for limiting magnitude. The limiting magnitude correction is 2 to the 6.5, remember that was what it's supposed to be, minus the limiting magnitude that you can actually see on a uh, given night where you're observing. Now this 2, where'd that come from? That's the idea that for each magnitude you decrease in brightness or increase in number, like going from first to second, second to third, you're gonna, there are going to be twice as many meteors second magnitude as first. There'll be twice as many third as second and so on. So that gives you kind of a distribution of the brightness of the meteors. You know, you're not going to have a hundred of each brightness. You're going to have a, a few really bright ones and then more fainter ones, still more, uh, even farther fainter ones. Kind of like a class with the uh, IQ scores or something in it. It's, it kind of works like that. <laughs> the 2.0 is a kind of a guess and it seems to work for the Perseid shower. Others, 2.5 or 3. Uh, seems to work better. Uh, some meteor showers, if they're uh, 100 first magnitude meteors, they'll be 300 second magnitude and 900 third magnitude. It triples every time. In other words, the limiting magnitude has an even greater effect on how many you're going to see if there are that many more faint ones that you're not going to see if the uh, sky is too bright. So here's an example. Suppose the limiting magnitude is four. Out here right now, it's about one. But if you go to a pretty dark place in town, like a park or something, it might be as good as four. So here's what you'd calculate. Two to the 6.5 minus four. That works out to 5.7. That means you have to take your count and multiply it by 5.7 to get the zenithal hourly rate, all else being equal. In other words, you're only seeing one 5.7th of the number of meteors you would if you had that good dark sky or something like 18% of the meteors. That's our main factor in observing meteors is the sky isn't dark enough and if you can't see 6.5 magnitude stars, uh, anything less than that is going to cause you to have a factor here that's uh, just going to be the fraction of what you're going to see. So you really need to have a good dark sky. Okay, altitude of the radiant. If the radiant is right on the horizon, you're going to miss half of them anyway, aren't you? Because they're going to be going down instead of up. Uh, depending on where it is in the sky, uh, the higher up it is, the better. That's why they call it the zenithal hourly rate. For example, and also another factor is, uh, remember the meteors are 50 or 60 miles up? That's when they're right overhead. Now, if it's way off on the horizon, it's 50 or 60 miles up from where it's overhead, but it may be 100 miles away. 
If you watch the Fred X planes coming in at night, you'll see them coming in from the northeast. To way off in the distance, the landing lights just look dim and red and then get brighter and brighter till it roars over your head and goes to the airport. Same thing here with the meteors. If they are way off and the radiant is near the horizon, then they're not going to be as bright as when the radiant is overhead. So this equation, this correction factor takes care of that. So if the altitude of the radiant is 24 degrees, add 6, that's 30. The sine of 30 degrees is 0.5. So when we divide by that, that means the, uh, uh, we need to multiply our uh, count by 2 to bring it up to what it would be if the radiant were right at the zenith. So that's that correction. Okay. And T, of course, was just the time of observing. So it's zenithal hourly rate. You have to put in the time and hours. So if you observe two hours, you cut everything in half. Okay. Epic did this for the Perseid meteor shower. And you find that over this uh, five-day period or six-night period, that the zenithal hourly rate was 88 per hour. And, okay, and I've seen the calculation for this, but it would go on for quite a while, so I decided to cut to the chase. And his calculation, which I uh, understand and agree with, is that there would be about 63 meters per hour of magnitude 2 at the zenith. zenith. He converted all of them to second magnitude, uh, from whatever magnitude they actually were, because remember he was trying to find out how many particles were there. So he just made them all the same size, and we'd wind up with that. Okay, the energy, the kinetic energy of the particle zipping through the air, one-half mv squared, mass times the speed squared. Notice the similarity to Einstein's E equals mc squared thing. I, I can't help but think that he was looking at this equation when he thought, if you take the mass and multiply it by the speed of light squared instead of the speed of a meteor squared, you'd get the total energy that it could be converted to. But that's uh, on a side. Okay, if all the mass is burned up and leads to radiation, you still can't see it all because some of it's in the ultraviolet, some of it's in the radio part of the spectrum. The part you pick up in your fillings, you know, that's, you're not seeing that part. So uh, let's, let's just guess there's about 20% going to be in the visible part of the spectrum, okay? Now the energy that a streak of light across the sky has is its intensity times the time. It's putting out a certain amount of energy per second times the number of seconds. And then the efficiency uh, is in the denominator because if it's only 20% efficient, that means it's going to have to put out a lot more energy than you're actually seeing from the streak in the sky, okay? We put the two together, one-half mv squared equals i t over beta, solve for m, and this bottom line is it tells you what the mass of a meteoric particle is as it's burning up in the air. That's how he came up with this. You measure how long, uh, the intensity of the light, how long it lasts, divide by the speed squared, and whatever number you pull out of the air for the efficiency of the conversion into light. Okay, For a second magnitude meteor, that works out to be three-tenths of a milligram, which is pretty much like a grain of sand, uh, very small. And that's the lower limit since uh, we're losing some of that energy because it doesn't all, the meteors don't all burn up all the way, do they? You know that most of these meteors uh, stop are slow way down before they're completely burned up, and then they just float to the ground. There are micrometeors all over everywhere, micrometeorites. If you get a magnet and go through your rain gutters along the edge of your roof, most of what sticks to that is the metallic type of micrometeorites that didn't contribute to the uh, light that you see in the sky. So we've got to kind of goose that up a little bit too. Now what if there were, you correct for that and say it's now it's one milligram. Then you have all these particles in three-dimensional space that the Earth is plowing through at 88 meteors per hour. And each one of them is three or is, is a milligram. Then the mass of that Perseid swarm that we're going through is 10 to the ninth tons. Again, uh, he figured that all out while he was in college and it looks reasonable to me, but uh, I 
think you would appreciate that I left that out. Okay, uh, later in 1933, uh, we better understood how the uh, luminosity of a meteor was generated. It wasn't just the particle burning up, but the ionization of the air around it, which kind of magnified it some. So that meant that the efficiency of the actual converting the energy into light was less. So that meant that the mass of a second magnitude meteor is now 12 milligrams, which is still pretty small. And remember, this is a second magnitude meteor, okay? Now that means that the mass of the Perseid swarm is jacked up an order of magnitude 10 to the 10th tons, okay? <coughs> now remember we've seen the term dirty snowballs for uh, comets from Fred Whipple. The uh, ice evaporates or sublimes, leaving behind the meteoric particles, and we've just estimated that mass, and the rest of them are kind of in loose aggregates. So to uh, allow for that, he made the efficiency even smaller, so then that meant the mass of the Perseid swarm is now two times 10 to the 11th tons. Now, we put that together with Whipple's estimate that the mass of Comet Swift-Tuttle was 10 to the 12 tons. Well, that leads to an easy calculation as to the percentage of dirt in the snowball. So it's got to be 20% this 2 times 10 to the 11th over 10 to the 12th. So 20% dirty particles and 80% snow or the water that evaporates. Now, as you can see, there's a lot of pulling things out of the air here, literally, but this gives us a kind of a handle on something that you might think would be impossible to even guess. Okay, so 1969, I was in graduate school and I decided to expand on EPIC's double count method to apply to any number of observers. First, I had to duplicate what he did and then expand it from there. So now I've got J is the number of observers instead of just two. All the rest of the symbols are the same. N is the number of meteors each observer sees. The capital N is the total, whether seen or not, and that's the probability factor of each observer. And M is the one seen in common by all the observers. So that's the same as before. Again, probabilities multiply. So the probability that all observers will see a given meteor is the product of all the probabilities, first one times second one times third one on out to however many observers you got. So putting that into just a simplified notation, the number is uh, this uh, pi is just, uh, you know what the capital sigma means, you add up this number, this number, this number. The pi is the same thing except product. You take this one times this one times this one. So that simplifies the notation. So. Uh, Going on, we rearrange that equation and we find that the uh, number of meteors, let's just take it one more step to get to the bottom line here. The total number of meteors you see is the, again the product of the individual counts, the first one times the second one times the third one, divided by all the ones they saw in common. A lot like the, his double count method except we've got an exponent here one over the number of observers minus one. So on the next one, we check out, see if this gives us his result. Suppose n, uh, suppose we've only got two observers and that's n1 times n2 over m. And what's one over two minus one? Well, that goes away. So that gives us exactly the same thing as his double count equation. If it hadn't worked out there, it had been over right then because uh, it, if you can't get the ones you already know back, then it's no good. Okay, now we expand it to three. Multiply all three counts together, divided by the one seen in common, and now this time it's one over two minus one, or one half. You just take the square root of this number. Going on to four observers, one, two, three, four, over the uh, ones in common, this time one over four minus one, or take the cube root of it. All of which had to be done by hand, I might mention, back in uh, 1966. Uh, so uh, it's, now it's just a button on the calculator. Okay, now you might be thinking sort of like 
beginners do. Uh, we can just put a smaller and smaller eyepiece in the <laughs> telescope and get an infinitely high power. That doesn't work, does it? Okay, same thing here. What if we had 100 observers? Then what? Well, what are the chances of all 100 observers seeing it? M is going to go down to nothing. So there's some kind of an optimum number, which so far I've determined is around three or four. Uh, we've tried five, and it starts to fall off a little. When you get where you hardly have any seen in common, then the equation doesn't work right. It's uh, not enough sampling size for it to work. So you can't uh, make valid calculations if you have too many observers. So three or four seems to work out the best. Statist statisticians use a kind of a general rule that the larger the sample size, the smaller the statistical error, and they use this equation to show that. That the error is the square root of the number of the samples you have divided by the number of samples. For example, <coughs> if you have 10 observations, then the square root of 10 is 3.2 over 10 is 32%. If you have 100, that's 10 over 100, that's 10%. If you have 1,000, that's 32 out of 1,000, or 3.2%. So you can see that the greater number of observations you make, the more accurate it's going to be. Okay. Now, another thing that uh, EPIC didn't work on, but we started working on this back in the 60s, uh, are meteors randomly distributed over time, or do they appear in groups or clusters? A lot of times when you're out observing meteors, you'll see one and then right away you see another one, and then nothing for a while. Is that still random distribution, or does it violate random? So, there's an equation for that, the Poisson distribution equation. If you divide up your observing time into an equal number of compartments, like if you observe for two hours, you got a 120 minute long compartments. Is every compartment gonna have the same amount of meteors in it? Suppose you had 120 meteors to make it easy. Is there gonna be one meteor in each one of those intervals for it to be randomly distributed? No, a lot of people think random means even. It doesn't, it's random. So the uh, number is gonna vary, but the equation tells us how it's gonna vary. So the law of averages doesn't predict an equal distribution <coughs> through all the intervals. So that's an important thing to remember. They're gonna come, uh, be long stretches with nothing, and then a lot of activity, and then nothing again. That's still random distribution, it's just not even. Okay, to test this out, a couple of guys uh, in 1970 in California, Running Springs, California, uh, timed all of the meteors for two hours on uh, August 12th, so these are Perseids. They saw 155 Perseids in 120 minutes. First of all, what does that tell you? That was doing pretty good, right? I looked up Running Springs, California on the map, and it's not anywhere near Los Angeles. It's east of the mountain range up in the high desert thing where all of these uh, people take gorgeous Palomar-like pictures with an eight-inch telescope. You know, that's, that's where they were. So that's why they saw that many meteors during that time period, okay? So the average number during one minute of intervals was 155 or out of 120 or 1.292. But we have all heard about the poor statistician who drowned while he was wading in a creek that had an average depth of four feet, haven't we? <laughs> Not all of the bins are going to have uh, 1.2 meteors in them. So each interval, uh, back up just a second there, uh, will vary from zero to four. There weren't any minute intervals that had more than four. There were a lot that had zero, one, two, and some had four. But that's not what was observed, nor what, what the equation would predict. Okay, this is the equation, and let me just put what the terms are. The I is the number of intervals, 120. A is the average number, which we just figured was 1.292. Uh, K is the number of meteors in each interval, one, two, three, four, or even zero, or even five. Uh, 
And that's all of the terms that are in the equation. And if you multiply those together, you'll find the predicted number of intervals containing zero or one or two or three meteors. It's pretty straightforward now that it's got calculators. Uh, just put the factorials down here. Uh, like uh, four factorial means four times three times two times one and five times four times three times two times one and so on. So those are the factorials that go into that spot right there, okay? Now, they, for number of intervals with no meteors, they calculated from the equation that there should be 33. They observed 34. One meteor in that interval, there should be 43, they got 41. And so on down the line here, you can see that on the next, the conclusion, there's no significant discrepancy between what you would predict from this randomness equation and what you actually saw. So they are randomly distributed, even though they're not evenly distributed. So that's an important thing about observing meteor showers, okay? Uh, George Brown and Roy Tucker and I checked this out at the meteor shower in 1975. We observed for three nights and uh, had eight and a half hours of observing. There was only one one minute interval in all that time that had more than the predicted number of meteors in it. So I think we nailed that one down that uh, they are randomly distributed. But we also noticed uh, uh, well, we saw that there are no concentrations within the Perseid meteor swarm. They're kind of randomly distributed, not evenly, but randomly. Okay? Sometimes you'll see a meteor and then another one in the same place a second or two later. That was what we thought we were going to measure, but we soon realized that that equation was for all over the sky. This one right following another is a whole different phenomenon and that is the meteors, or meteoroids kind of run in pairs or does one split up as it hits the atmosphere and then you see one and then you see the other. That's a whole different thing and uh, you could figure out uh, what happens by timing them to a closer interval. Uh, next there. It's just like you uh, use a short interval of like 15 seconds instead of a minute or not. I think we know that that happens, so I'm, I'm not planning on testing that hypothesis. You'll see it. You'll see one and then another right in the same spot. Okay. Need the observers in groups of three or four. Here's the equipment. Okay. Each observer has to be able to record a signal that shows uh, what time it was and that he saw the meteor. Okay. Uh, also, if you have voice capability, you put down the magnitude per se to sporadic. We're obviously not punching this into a computer or you're going to miss half of the meteors. This has got to be something you can do with a little clicker or something to count them and then talk into a tape to get the rest of these. Any other things that are interesting like the color path and any sounds you might hear. Okay. Here's the equipment we used to use, and the last time we did this was in 1977 we had this set up. We had uh, a tone generator which put out, uh, it was designed to run a carousel, a set of carousel slide projectors like we had in the planetarium. And the tone generator uh, would go beep, 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 depending on which of the inputs you uh, closed with the switch. For the switches, we used a carousel slide projector advance thing, and it's occurred to me that most of the stuff in here, you all are too young to have ever seen it. So this is the controller that uh, is used to advance and reverse a carousel slide projector, and I even got a focus button on it. And uh, you, uh, we were just using it as a switch. So whenever we saw a meteor, we'd push the button. Then uh, we had this uh, four track tape recorder and the tone generator went into that, one of the tracks. The WWV receiver, which you've already seen, went into another track and all the microphones went into a third one. We didn't use all four tracks. And I've got some pictures of some of these things here. Here is the four track tape recorder, which is an enormous thing. Those of you who have been to board meetings at our house have seen this thing sitting in the living room it kind of dominates the bookshelves, and it's, uh, it's so heavy that when I was 30 years old, I could barely pick it up, and I, 
I haven't even tried in quite a while. But it's got four tracks going the same way. Now, let's see, next is uh, when we'd play this back, this fortunately had to be indoors. Uh, the, uh, just one uh, quick aside about that tape recorder, one time we had it set up down at Durley Bratton's place, our other member who has an asteroid named after him, we had it set up at his place down near uh, uh, Oxford, Mississippi, and the extension cord would not reach from where the house was to where we were, had everything all set up, would not reach. Of course, it runs off 110. There was a roll of barbed wire on the ground there out on this farm. So George and I unraveled pieces of barbed wire, stuck it into the end of the extension cord and wrapped it around the terminals of the tape deck and operated that thing all night with that kind of setup. But <laughs> next day, it was back in the house on our dining room table playing back through the term tone generator, which then would close circuits coming out of it. It's just like the going in, going backwards. And the WWV was on there, and the audio channel, we could listen to all the comments, and we put it into this huge strip chart recorder. I've got a picture of that. It's, uh, well, this is, uh, I'll, I'll show you the picture in a minute. We observed uh, all night for three nights, but, uh, Here's a two minute excerpt of the uh, observing from 7.23, 2.23 in the morning to 2.25. And if you hit that, I hope this will gonna work. You hear anything? I don't even see it advancing. Yeah. It's a speakers turned on. Oh, it is advancing. We've got to get the sound up somehow. Okay, can you turn it up more? Okay. What you're going to hear is the WWV on one channel and the beep, beep, beeps from the tone generator on the other. Okay. That's the WWV. And in about 13 seconds. Did you hear the low frequency one afterwards? Yeah. So that lets you get the exact time for it. You just count the ticks in that seconds from the last time he said what the time was and that first beep occurs. Then you count the ticks in that seconds to when the next one is. <coughs> and then 40 seconds later, must have been a bright one because all four of us got it. At the half minute, you'll hear it skip a beat. That's how you can tell it's the half minute. And 10 seconds more. It should be four, yeah, the, the couple of them say me too right on the end there. Okay, so that's kind of what these were like in the playback. Here was the strip chart recorder we ran it into. I never could lift that thing by myself. It lived out on the floor in our garage for many years until we got a second car and then we had to get rid of it. But uh, this is not exactly the one. Well, the one we had had six pins on it and uh, the uh, this is what the charts look like coming out of it. I've got some here that are the actual ones. 
And you can see all the little marks all along it where the pens were wiggling. Where it wiggles is where a meteor was. And then little tick marks down the side where the WWV uh, se every second where it would tick, tick, tick. So we had to go back through all of this and transcribe it into uh, a usable data sheet. So the next sh uh, slide should show the, uh, the report forms. Yeah, so we had to go back and manually enter all of that with the, the tape number. By the way, the, some of you have never seen this. This is a uh, open reel seven inch tape that fit on that monster tape recorder and you'd run the tape through it and uh, rewind it when you were through and this was the recording we had. Uh, also, fortunately, since that tape player turned out not to work when I went to use it, I had a backup on a cassette that just had the WWV and the tones on it. Didn't have any of the voice information on it, but Rick's gonna help me get the uh, other one working and so we may have some uh, in the future some sounds from that but this is a cassette so i mean i don't even see these this is a when those came out it was really something amazing you get beethoven's ninth symphony and put it in your pocket you know that was really something or in the car yes okay wrapping up here um this was transcribed, the observers here were me and Karen and George Brown and uh, Wilson Northcross, who comes to our meetings occasionally, and Durley Bratton, the other asteroid person. Those were the five who were working on it for, for this particular night. We made up a better form later and used it a couple of times. And, and then uh, George got killed and Roy moved to Arizona and the whole thing kind of fell apart. And we haven't done this in a long time. So this is the, um, another one of our observing sheets. This is one in Audubon Park where we hardly saw anything. This is the whole night's work here because the uh, limiting magnitude was so bright. You know, the sky was very bright. We just wanted to see what we could do from in town. Then we put all this in a TI-59 programmable calculator. Some of you may remember that, some of you may not. I've got a picture of one there. I had one and got rid of it, put it in a yard sale a few years ago. But uh, they really were. It predated, uh, this was like Excel. Uh, I mean, you could actually write up a program and save it on these little strips that it would read into the side. And our, and our data, we put it in as a 10 digit number, five for the time, like 732.18 point and then 11001 for the five people observing and a one meant they saw it and a zero meant they didn't. And we could uh, add up each column separately after we multiplied by 10 and got rid of the left side. And that, that we could get our numbers from that and sort of automatically do something this thing was never meant to do. So we, uh, we could get all of those from the data that we put into the TI-59, okay? Here's what we need to do to observe in the 21st century. Instead of that carousel projector thing, if we get some tone generators, which I think you can probably get as uh, telephone keypads, touch pads, and combine them and run it into a digital audio recorder like I've got on my pocket right now, this big, and uh, combine the WWV and the microphones into another one and put that on the other channel. Then we'd have everything we needed for observing that would fit in a shoe box instead of giving a half a dozen people hernias carrying it around. Uh, so, and it's all battery operated and easy to use. So, okay, uh, next. And then for the playback, I would suggest we take what's on the, uh, the recorder and play it back into the computer, upload it. Then uh, when you're running that on the computer, you can see the actual times across the bottom. It's showing, displaying the times, which we can write down. The WWV in the commentary, we can put all the extra information. The tone decoder, I've got a plan for one of those. 
that would light up different LEDs so you could tell which observer actually saw the different meteors. And uh, next uh, is the picture of this thing. I found this online where you can, uh, this corresponds to the telephone pitches. Uh, and you can, uh, you'd only need three or four of them, not all uh, 12 that they have here. But this would be the touch tone decoder and the output is a, uh, either a closed circuit or it puts out so many milliamps or something that would light up an LED so we could tell what it was, okay? Uh, and then put the data. It's still going to have to have some manual steps. We have to go back and uh, put these on an Excel spreadsheet, but it'd be a whole lot easier than that TI-59. Uh, we can automatically, on the next uh, slide there, you can uh, see which observers recorded it and uh, put the time in and put in all the comments, just write them in or enter them by hand. And it would look something like this. This would be the uh, time track along the uh, recorder that it automatically displays. All we need is one WWV reading and that converts it to the, the central daylight time and the, the Greenwich mean time and uh, whether it's Perseid or sporadic, we could enter these uh, verbally and then which uh, observers actually saw it, one, two, three, four, five. Add them up this way and it gives us the counts, the N number for each observer and check crossways with a condition statement. <coughs> if all five of them are ones, then it counts this as one scene in common. If there's somebody missing, it doesn't. And from those, we automatically calculate the probabilities, the total number of meteors seen, and, the, and we can even do the zenithal hourly rate on it. So all, so all would be there in a very small amount of technology, some of which I know how to do, some of which I don't. So, uh, okay. Next. Hold on. Okay. So I can do all of this. Y'all heard that? <laughs> The only trick is the audio, yes. is the is the voice recording, and time syncing the voice recording. Everything else I can do. Well, that's easy. All you got to do is to get to the first time the WWV says uh, the time is and beep. And we're going to use satellite. We're going to use GPS well, satellite signal. Well. Okay, well, if you know how to do that, fine. I've still got this. Okay. Well, okay. That's, that's why I'm showing this to multiple people. My technology stopped about 15 years ago, I think, and I think I've been losing some since then. Uh, tiramisu? <laughs> Small okay. I thought you were saying what it would cost me to have this oh, done. Because no, no. I made him a raspberry tiramisu once. And, yeah, okay. Hmm. Okay. So, is this something we want to do? Uh, it doesn't take, for, on your part, you don't have to derive the equations anymore. All you got to do is agree to sit out there and push a button when you see a meteor and say something to the microphone about how bright it was and where it was and that sort of thing. And then uh, Rick will uh, fix up all the data when we take it back in in the light of day. So this, this is kind of what I'm planning on for the meteor showers for the Percy at this time. Okay. And, uh, Groups of well, uh, we need a set of equipment for each one. Groups of three or four. But you know, uh, if they were far enough apart and we had enough touch tone things yeah. that were distinguishable, I think it'd be up to 12, you can separate them and take, so you can analyze, say, these three and these three and these three rather than 12 all at yeah. once. Yeah. Uh, you can separate them into groups. In fact, we did that uh, before. When we had five, we didn't get a big M, but when uh, we, we took, we kind of unbeknownst, we left out one person and didn't see very many, and then we got a lot better numbers after that, and then we did two and two, and that's how that worked out. So that's, the, that's how you do it, and that's the proposal, and... It doesn't matter how long they push the button, just they push the button. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is going to be, uh, yeah, this is easy. Okay. Oh. <laughs> we had to do that so I could stop. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you all for your endurance.